Can you explain us what's happening in Canada, around cannabis right now? Yeah, absolutely. So we're moving to legalize cannabis. Um, so how it works is we have kind of a federal cannabis act, which lays out minimums, right? So the minimum age of access is 18 years old, for example. And then the provinces across Canada and territories actually have the powers to kind of adjust those. So what we're actually seeing across Canada is, um, you know, different ages of access, um, different um, uh, distribution models um, across Canada. So it's kind of like a natural experiment happening. Well, we'll, we'll see how these different models are impacting things like usage rates and other things um, you know some of the details of that model are things like uh, maximum possession for adults set at 30 grams um, that will have a whole regulated system of production and distribution there's a lot of really interesting pieces around young people one of that those being that for young people under the legal age of access they're decriminalizing possession of under five grams of cannabis which was a you know a pretty big step forward um, especially in Canada we know that uh, young people 18 to 25, uh, followed by young people 12 to 17, actually have the highest number of drug-related arrests in Canada, and over 80% of those are for cannabis possession alone. So legalization in and of itself has a massive, massive p potential to really kind of change the game in terms of, you know, how we're criminalizing young people for, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, things that actually don't indicate that they're, you know, bad folks just for possessing cannabis, but actually have very substantial impacts um, on the kind of their trajectories um, in the future. One of the main arguments, as far as I know, of the Trudeau government to legalize cannabis was to protect young people. So what, how do you see the, the, the regulation model? Will it protect young people? So that's a really, really complex question, and I think it's really interesting because I think when we hear protect young people, our you know, what we reach to is, is more restrictions. So we think in order to protect young people, we just have to layer on all these rules. But actually what, you know, what we've been advocating for, what Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy have been advocating for is the inclusion of young people in those policy decisions. So in fact, actually, uh, protection perhaps looks like having access to education, improving young people's health literacy so that they can uh, make choices. And if they're going to choose to use cannabis, they can do it in ways that are a lot more safe. Uh, and then other things around that is thinking about, you know, when you set age of access, for example, there was a debate in Canada about that being as high as 25 years old. You know, what happens when you're criminalizing the most, uh, the highest users um, in a country of cannabis when you're moving to legalize it? And perhaps protection in that case looks like including people over the age of 18 and 19 in a legal market so that they have access to regulated and tested products so that they know what they're getting, that, you know, at the point of purchase, there will be interaction, conversation, you know, harm reduction, you know, opportunities for that kind of interaction that is missed when we're purchasing off of the, you know, the underground uh, market. So I think that protection for me really looks like, um, you know, improving our education, um, you know, ensuring that we're not, um, you know, sticking to the same kind of fear-based approaches, which we're kind of seeing still happen here and just slightly repackaged to look really shiny and new, but really the undertones are still stigma-based and still fear-based. I think that there, you know, because, you know, we're so concerned about this protection around young people, there still is a lot of work that we're going to like normalize um, cannabis but I think that you know there is some benefits to, to normalizing it and, and it's really about normalizing the conversation. You mentioned the importance of including people who are affected by policies into making that policies so how do you see the process that led to legalization of cannabis in Canada? Was it inclusive? Was it transparent? So I think that the Canadian government really did a very extensive consultation. I think their external task force that really kind of, uh, you know, visited all provinces and territories and really did try to bring diverse stakeholders to the table. You know, I think they did a really good job. I think their report was really clear and really reflected what, you know, what we heard in a lot of those, those consultations. With that said, you know, I think that there needed to be a few pushes to ensure that they were including particular, um, you know, groups of, you know, people who are using drugs, um, young people, especially young people who are using cannabis. Well, what the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy did was we actually organized our own roundtable and we invited the task force to come to our roundtable. So we just wanted to include that because they had the, such a, uh, an emphasis on protecting youth that they were actually prioritizing youth in that process. So since then we've been kind of carving out a new relationship I think with the federal government and they've been listening to us uh, in ways that we've never experienced in like the history of, of, of um, our organization. Can you speak about um, uh, regional differences across Canada, like what, what 
different approach, different provinces took on, on the regulation of cannabis? Yeah, absolutely. So um, each of the provinces, because of the way our constitutional powers are divided, um, the provinces are actually in charge of things like um, distribution, things around consumption, public consumption, those kinds of things. Um, so we see that with our alcohol model. So across Canada, you know, if you visit different provinces, you'll notice there are different kind of bodies in charge of a sa uh, the sales uh, and distribution of alcohol. So in Canada, we're seeing a variety of different models, and I'll just pull on a few different ones. So for example, in Ontario, uh, the age of access is 19, and that is parallel with the age of access for alcohol. And they're going to have the government running the online stores. So online stores are really, really important, especially if you're living in like northern Ontario, right? You don't maybe have access to those retail sites. Um, and then the actual retail stores will be uh, private, so that they'll be licensed um, by the Alcohol and Gaming Commission, and, and um, they'll operate kind of like on a, on a private model. Um, places like BC, uh, age of access is uh, 19, also parallel with alcohol, and they're doing a mixed model approach. So similar to their alcohol distribution model where they have both BC liquor and private retail stores, the same thing's going to happen in Canada, in, in, uh, with uh, cannabis in BC as well. So they're going to have a, a mix of both public um, brick and mortar shops as well as private, and then the government will control the online retail stores. Um, Quebec is a really interesting kind of subcase, um, and so their age of access currently is 18, but a new government was just elected in that wants to actually up that to 21. So if it was pushed up to 21, that would be the highest in the country and would supersede any kind of uh, minimum ages of access for alcohol across um, the country. Um, and currently they're going with a completely um, public, uh, government-run model. So it would be government in charge of both online and on-the-ground um, distribution shops. What's really interesting in the case of um, driving under the influence, so there's a, a parallel impairment bill um, being revised and introduced um, as well. Um, and uh, in, in Quebec, they've actually implemented a zero tolerance for all people um, with THC in their system to drive. So, you know, I mean this, uh, you know, considering we don't actually have the science to be able to measure impairment, this actually brings up a lot of really important questions around, you know, are we perhaps criminalizing um, folks for simply using cannabis, but who aren't driving impaired, who maybe are consuming on Sunday and driving on Tuesday, but they still have, they still will test over the threshold of THC in our system because it stays in our body for about seven days. So Quebec is the only one that has uh, an outright ban for all folks. Places like Ontario are doing um, under the age of 21 is zero tolerance and for novice drivers. Um, so, so we're seeing a bit of variations, but I think Quebec is definitely one of the, the most restrictive models. So that generally are the three kinds of models that we're looking at, either a mix of public and private, um, entirely private with government oversight, um, or entirely government run. And what do you think, what will be the public health impact of uh, cannabis legalization in Canada? It's a really hard question because I think what we're seeing in the state is sure there's a slight uptick in adult use but nothing's exploded um, that youth use has has stay, stay, stayed pretty consistent um, and so I think we could also argue that the US also oper, oper, uh, operates on a more kind of commercialized model so in here we're really kind of you know basing our model on principles of, of public health and safety so I think we can anticipate perhaps even better outcomes there actually is not going to be a lot of places that will be ready to uh, distribute cannabis so we won't actually have very many cannabis cannabis retail stores yet, and it actually might take up to 18 months to get those actually implemented across Canada. So we're going to have legalization, we're going to have to likely access online for a, for a little while, which isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, but yeah, so, and then another kind of public health kind of net gain that I think we can also anticipate is kind of building on the growing research around cannabis substitution. So using cannabis in lieu of, uh, or to reduce the use of other substances. So we're already kind of seeing that, but we just don't really understand the mechanisms behind it as well. So I think one thing we could anticipate is if we're tracking other, you know, alcohol use, tobacco use, and other substance use, that we maybe could see a decrease in those things, which would actually be a public health gain if you consider kind of the harms risk profile of cannabis compared to other substances. Yeah, what, what will be the most interesting questions in, like in the first, let's say, three years of legalization? Yeah. What you expect that should will be interesting to answer and see the results? Yeah, so I mean, for me, the research that we're doing right now looks at um, folks who are living on the downtown east side who are using um, cannabis to reduce or eliminate the use of other drugs. Um, you know, for me, I think it will be really important to, you know, not just think about how cannabis legalization is affecting the general population, but really narrow in on these, um, you know, these more marginalized voices, you know, that when we're talking about, you know, legalizing cannabis, is it really legalized if uh, a gram costs $10? Is that 
that really accessible to all kind of you know segments of the population. What we're seeing right now is that um, you know the the folks that we're talking with are accessing cannabis through these free distribution programs that have popped up downtown, and then they're also going to illegal dispensaries because they're able to buy grams for three, four dollars, kind of those bottom of the bin strains. So what happens when we shift into a completely legal and regulated model? And because of the way you know wholesale pricing works out, because of regulations on how um, how low the pricing can actually be for the sale of cannabis, uh, you know, I think there's going to be really important implications for vulnerable and marginalized populations. As you say, there are <clears throat> many people who are concerned that cannabis legalization only benefits the, the wealthy and the privileged people. Uh, what do you see? Are there any specific policies that can, uh, you know, tackle this or that can address these problems and, like, maybe distribute the benefits to the vulnerable yeah. groups of society? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really interesting because if we we look at the medical cannabis market, that's kind of our blueprint for what the industry itself will look like. It's predominantly, of course, like white and and male driven, um, and some of these companies are you know quite big. So there are some really important questions about you know how do we ensure a more inclusive market? How do we, for example, get these illegal dispensary operators to transition into the legal um, and regulated space? So I think that those questions are are really important. But um, you know, I think. I think that there is some truth to the statement that legalization um, will benefit few. And I think that there are, you know, we're seeing some really amazing initiatives come out of the United States. I know Steve was talking about Massachusetts today, and I think that they're an excellent example. Um, you know, they have an equity program there where, um, you know, they're expunging all of these past records uh, for things that are legal in their new um, system. Uh, and they're also letting them jump the queue in terms of applying for licensing to be able to sell, sell cannabis and produce cannabis. So, you know, so from where I stand, I think that there needs to be more mechanisms put in place by the federal government as well as provinces, um, and they need to be working together to talk about what ex expungement looks like, especially for simple possession, um, you know, especially for people that have been charged since 2015 when we introduced the legislation. Um, so thinking about, you know, uh, what are the mechanisms that we can, we can um, you know, apply there to, you know, not just uh, eliminate criminal records, but also ensure that we're having, um, you know, fair access to and participation in the legal and regulated market. Um, otherwise, it'll be dominated by few. And there are so, you know, a, a lot of things that we have to be proud of in Canada is that, you know, we have a really big, I'm going to say proud, but a really big underground illicit economy that, you know, BC Cannabis, you know, they have predictions that the underground cannabis economy is worth $7 billion. So how do we ensure that those growers that have been growing, you know, cannabis for 20 years are able to access the new and legal market? Like, maybe they want to be micro producers, but how do we, how do we help them get from A to B? And I think that's going to be really, really critical in ensuring a more diverse market. Thank you very much.